Hello everyone, my name is Vox. This is my review on the GPD Win 3. This video will be a bit different in that GPD is launching a new device with two specific SOCs, the 1135 G7 and the 1165 G7. Before I get into all the specifics on those two chips, let's go over what is the same between both units. The screen is a 720p 5.5 inch HIPS display with 5th gen Corning Gorilla Glass. The screen itself also features 10 point multi-touch capabilities. I'll have more to talk about regarding screen latency and total system latency later in this review. Both have a default TDP power limit 1 at 20 watt with a PL2 of 25 watt. 16 gigabytes of LPDDR4 4266 MHz in dual channel configuration, a 1 terabyte BiWin SSD capable of nearly 2 gigabytes a second of throughput read and write. This can be upgraded and the Win3 actually supports PCIe Gen 4 NVMe storage, which will matter more when Microsoft's Direct Storage makes its debut later on. But it's nice to have this available for future use. Worth noting that with PCIe 4, you can get up to 8GB a second in throughput, which is four times the amount of the included SSD. You'd have to buy that upgrade separately, but it'll make a big difference when games start making use of Microsoft's Direct Storage and SFS. I.O. includes one Thunderbolt 4 port that can be used with an eGPU. Unfortunately, I no longer have an eGPU enclosure to properly test this. One USB 3.2 Type-A port at the top and a 3.5mm audio jack. A Type-A2 micro SDXC card slot. This is capable of supporting A2 compliant micro SD cards. The other I.O. input you see on this list is what GPU is listing because of the dock that is sold separately. I don't have this dock, but I do have a standard USB-C hub that works exactly the same way. There is the included capacitive keyboard, which is tucked underneath the extremely cool magnesium alloy slider. This is GPD's first slider, and GPD claims it's capable of opening and closing 50,000 times. So far in my two weeks with the device, it's still as firm as it was on day one. With the slider locking in place at the top and bottom, the keyboard is nicely backlit and is more than sufficient to see even in a bright room. I'll share more of my thoughts on the keyboard toward the end of this review. Last on this list is the inclusion of the game controller functions and inputs. The highlight of the show is GPD's new analog trigger buttons for L2 and R2. We can finally play racing games as they should be played on the Win 3. Thankfully, we are still rocking the Vita inspired D-pad and face buttons. Capping it off, Rumble finally makes its way back onto the Win 3. I'll have more to say about Rumble later on as well. Two things not touched on in this spec sheet are the included microphone, which is sufficient enough to dictate speech to text as well as a TPM module on board, if you wanted to enable secure boot on your Win3. A quick segue here, if you wanted to get into the BIOS while the GPD Win3 is booting up, keep hitting the FN key until you feel the keyboard vibrate, and then hold FN plus the Dell key. All right, let's address the immediate difference. The main takeaway here that you need to know, for Indiegogo, there is a $100 difference between the two, or the 1165 G7 version is 12.5% more expensive than the 1135 G7 version. So then, what's the performance difference between the two? The 1165 G7 version has a slightly higher CPU frequency, but the most important feature is that it has 16 more execution units, or 20% more execution units. So do we really see better performance out of more GPU cores at lower wattages? Or is it exclusive to higher wattages only? The answer is yes, we do see a performance difference at lower wattages, and I'll even show you why we see a performance difference. But first, onto my testing methodology. Both systems were wiped using an image directly from Microsoft. The stock power profile was used. Both machines' Intel power balance was set to CPU 1, GPU 31. All TDP adjustments happened in the BIOS exclusively. Both units installed using the latest January 4th, 9126 Intel drivers. Lastly, I did use Hardware Info and RevaTuner to verify power levels as the benches occurred. First, Let's take a look at my tried and true benchmark going back to 2017, Unigen's Heaven. What I'd like you to take note of is the 5 watt scores throughout these series of benchmarks. At 5 watts, we see an absolutely massive performance delta, and when reviewing the data via hardware info, we see the GPU power is severely restricted. Looking further at GPU frequencies, for a large part, they're pretty consistent between each other. The actual culprit is that the voltage for the GPU on the 1135G7 version is using 0.415 volt, and the voltage on the 1165G7 version is using 0.39 volt to hit 100 megahertz. This is effectively a 25 millivolt undervolt in the favor of the 1165G7 chip. This is already advantageous. 
but it's further compounded by the fact that we're able to feed more execution units effectively and thus more effectively skirt along that ceiling of the GPU power allowance. How I read this data is that the 1135G7 SoC are most likely bin chips whose GPU part didn't fully qualify to be an 1165G7 part. The base fact that we need 25 millivolt more voltage to hit 100 megahertz on the 1135G7 GPU highlights this greatly. The end result is that all 5 watt tests clearly favor the 1165G7. Not only can we power each EU at lower voltage to hit 100 megahertz, but we have more of them and are able to more fully use the power budget inside that 5 watt scope. And this is the reason why we see in pretty much all of the benchmarks I've done, the 1165G7 is winning at 10 watt, 15 watt, and 20 watt as well. Not to the same degree, but it's still winning. The 1165G7 are better binned and are capable of running at a lower wattage. Bottom line here, you are paying more to have an undervolted GPU. This is why it's worth it to get the 1165G7 version. Very quickly, I just wanted to make note that the x-axis was TDP wattage, so I would be testing them at 5 watt together, 10 watt together, 15 watt together, and 20 watt together. This next benchmark that we're looking at is the Street Fighter V 720p max settings. It uses Unreal Engine 4. It still paints the same type of picture as Heaven does, the 1165G7 version is winning throughout. I would tend to believe that most modern engines are going to target more horizontally scaled GPUs, meaning more cores, more execution units. That's just how most modern engines are targeting things anyhow. So even without the voltage advantage, I would tend to believe that this is going to be the case regardless. This benchmark is Resident Evil 6. It runs at 720p. The default settings are already high, so I just left them at that. It uses Capcom's great MT framework engine. It is also using DX9 to render to the screen. Now, obviously 5 watt and 10 watt are winning. 5 watt is winning great as it has been across the board for pretty much every one of my benchmarks. But the one thing that I do want to point out is that the 15 watt and 20 watt score, the 1135G7 is pulling ahead. The reason for this is because of GPU power allowance. If I had just set this to a TDP of 16 watt or a TDP of 22 watt, that would have bumped up the, the total allowance so that we could kick it into a higher gear. Basically, the 1165 G7 version had to stay in third gear here. It couldn't go to the fourth gear because the power budget just wouldn't allow it, and this is the result of that. The next benchmark is Final Fantasy XV. Its settings is 720p standard and uses the Luminous engine. And once again, paints a very similar story. One thing worth noting here is that if you were looking to play this game, you do need around 22 to 23 watts to hit a consistent 30 FPS. So if you were interested in playing this on the GPU Win 3, the 1165G7 version needs about 23 watts. If you bump it up to 25 watts, most likely throughout the game, you'll be 30 FPS throughout the thing. So that's just FYI for you. Alrighty, Street Fighter 4. It is using max settings at 720p. Once again, still using that fantastic MT framework. It is running DirectX 9 as a backend. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that how this works is if we take a look at the 20 watt score, you can clearly see, if you go back and take a look at the Resident Evil 6 benchmark, it's still using MT framework. We're still using DirectX 9. But at 20 watt, you can see that we can push the 1165G7 version into a higher gear. And that's where we get that massive bump at 20 watt versus the 1135G7 version. So again, whenever I talk about these things and power allowances and stuff, think about how much gas it would need to push a car into another gear. And if you don't give it enough power to do that, that's what's going to be these performance deltas and performance differences. Uh, outside of just voltage stuff. When you want more power, you need to kick it into another gear. This is the result of it. This particular benchmark, this is the last remnant. I just use standard settings. I just click start. I wanted to get a look at one particular reproducible benchmark that was using Unreal Engine 3, and this came up. At 5 watt, it's like such a dramatic change in terms of performance. It's not a 40% bump. It's a 400% bump. It's absolutely ludicrous but as soon as we give it 10 watt 1135 basically wakes up and keeps in tow or in line with the 1165g7 version having said that the 1165g7 version still wins at the same wattage this particular benchmark again i was trying to look at different engines because i wanted to target engines more than anything because those are going to be the foundation of how these chips react to different engines 
This is Monster Hunter Online. It was running at 720p, no anti-aliasing. It is running CryEngine 3. If we take a look at these scores, this is the one that was interesting throughout. This is the one where no matter where I put it, 10 watt, 15 watt, 20 watt, the 1135G7 version was in the correct gear for this particular game at 10 watt. The takeaway from this isn't that the 1135G7 is better here. It's just that I found the sweet spot for the 1135G7 version and I found the worst spot just before we can kick it into another gear for the 1165G7 version. However, because I was testing each one at these specific TDPs, this was the data. So this is what I'm showing you guys. The last set of benchmarks are the classic tried and true 3D Mark ones. So up first is Time Spy. Again, we have a pretty clear indication of what's going on, and we can clearly see that the 1135G7 version, once again, has that advantage at 15 watt over the 1165G7 watt just because of power constraints. Rounding it all out is Fire Strike. This is a benchmark that I ran a bazillion times when I bought my R9 290, but it's kind of just funny just to take a look at these scores. And again, these are just the scores within 5 watt, 10 watt, 15 watt, and 20 watt. These are really the scores that it, it, you shouldn't really be going higher unless you're plugged in. 20 watt is the absolute ceiling you should be running this device while on battery. While it can run on battery, even at 35 watt, you will be doing damage to the battery by pulling that much amperage through it. Please don't. Obviously, you can use it when you're plugged in, but please be mindful not to run at those wattages on battery often. Uh, it's something that I just, I, um, I, you should be concerned about. Um, but regardless, this is really cool to see, uh, especially just taking a look at these numbers. Go over to 3 Mark's benchmark survey result and search through other GPUs that are out now and compare these numbers. They're actually pretty wild to look at. And remember that the 1165G7 goes higher still. And this is what it looks like at 35 watt on Firestrike. Outside of taking a look at what these devices do for gaming, and it is a gaming-centric device, but we should still take a look at CPU performance as well. Here are the Geekbench results from both units as well as a C4D R20 bench. For the 1165G7 in this demonstration, it is hitting 44 watts. Because this is a small cluster using a tremendous amount of energy, obviously the CPU is hitting 100 degrees Celsius. It's a recommended to cap TDP on the 1165G7 at 35 watts if you plan on using the device docked as a general computer. Speaking to the CPU alone, the Willow cores are genuinely very good and place it in the league of high-end desktop class CPUs. Let's talk about power, thermal, and battery. Again, by default, the GPD Win 3's TDP is power limit 1 of 20 watt and power limit 2 of 25 watt. In my opinion, this power limit's too high. It's not because of the heatsink. In fact, the heatsink on the Win 3 might arguably be the absolute best thing about it. More on that later. The problem is that when we look at this 20 watt TDP, when you play demanding games, this is going to translate into around 90 minutes of battery life. Now, don't just take that 90 minutes of battery life number and run with it. This is only going to be the case when you're playing bigger AAA games. If you play a game that isn't demanding, in this case, Dead Cells, you can see that package power is around 4 watts and total system power would translate to 6 hours of gameplay. However, because AAA games will undoubtedly use 20 watt, this is why my personal recommendation is to set the TDP to 15 watt. At this TDP, you are guaranteed worst case scenario of 2 hours of battery life. Something that I've talked about since the WinMax, 2 hours of battery life is the absolute basement of acceptable battery life to me. So I tend to gear my TDP around battery life instead of performance. At the end of the day, these devices are portable and battery is a concern. However, the Win 3 is indeed capable of quick charging. Based on the data I've gathered, this is what the battery curve looks like. With the included 65 watt charger, the maximum incoming charge rate is 35 watts. The GPD Win 3 will charge from 10% all the way up to 85% in about 45 minutes. At that point, from 85% to 100%, it'll trickle charge to not damage the battery. This remaining 15% will take an additional hour. So it will take an hour and 45 minutes to charge the battery completely. For those that want to take extra precautions and use slower charging methods, you can. I've tested 5V and 12V, and they do charge. The only requirement of 5V charging is that it needs to be 3A. This will limit you to around 13 watts coming into the unit. 
Please be aware, this isn't enough energy to use the device at the same time. It will take four hours to fully charge the device with a 5 volt 3 amp charger. Flipping around to the other side from low charging to maximum power use, yes, it is possible to take the GPD Win 3 up to 35 watts and use the device. Here's a long burn in run of both units at 35 watts. Notice that the 1135G7 doesn't even use 35 watt in total. It will flirt around 32 watts, but largely it'll stay at 30 watts. For the 1165G7 model, it easily goes up to 35 watt, and as a result, the temps do get hotter, but nothing to be concerned about at all. If we take an immediate look after this burn-in through a thermal camera, I've also used a non-contact thermometer to double check the temps. Roughly, there is a 2 degrees Celsius difference. The camera sees it as 2C hotter, so it's actually a bit cooler in reality. But before I segue into thermals with regard to holding the device, I do want to highlight here how absolutely amazing this heatsink is. It wasn't that long ago when the WinMax came out, and that heatsink topped out at 33 watts. For the WinMax, as soon as it hits 33 watts, it's a quickly losing battle. For the Win 3, it can actually handle 35 watt loads and average, average around 80 degrees Celsius. It cannot be understated. It's a truly outstanding heatsink. So the heatsink can handle fantastic temperatures. How does it actually feel when holding the device? At 35 watt temps, the right side of the device where the battery is housed is actually where the device gets warm, but not over the heatsink. That part is actually always cool. It should be noted this is irrespective if the device is plugged in or not. Now, this is in an area that I feel is super subjective. For me, the device feels a bit warm even at 35 watts. Now, maybe I'm just so accustomed to how unbelievably hot the GPD Win 1 got that anything under that feels like <laughs> the Arctic. So I think I need to surmise this particular part to translate to other devices. Do you feel the switch in handheld mode gets hot? What about the PS Vita? Have you ever thought that was hot to hold? If the answer is yes, I'd wager you're going to think that the GP2 N3 gets too hot to hold. However, what I could recommend is, again, setting the device to 15 watts. Then the thermal radiation of the device considerably goes down. Another reason to set, set the device at 15 watt TDB. Furthermore, if you were concerned about how loud the fan gets, often when someone asks me if the fan is loud, what they actually mean is, can you hear the fan? And the answer is that anything over 12 watt TDP, you'll hear the fan. I would only qualify the device getting loud if you push TDP up to 35 watts that demand that power. Otherwise, even at 15 watt, you do hear the fan, but it's relatively low. The next chapter, sound screen, game controls, and latency. For the speakers, they're stereo. <laughs> and as Lan has noted, they are loud and functional. At the higher end, they are crazy loud, but frequencies crash together and, and they do get muddy. Setting volume to 70% will begin to diffuse those frequencies for that sound to come through a bit more proper. They, they operate. They work. They're not great, but they get loud and they're functional. Regarding the screen, I don't own a color emitter, color meter, <laughs> so I lack the ability to, to pull color data from the screen. What I do have is a high frame rate camera and can count frames. Capturing 960 FPS video of Blur Buster's two demos, from my count, graded grade response rate on the screen itself is around 21 milliseconds where persistence response rate on the panel is around 28 milliseconds by my count. This isn't ideal as it's a 60 hertz panel and we should technically be at most 16.6 milliseconds, but IPS panels aren't known for their speed. As this is applied to full system latency from button press to update on the screen, ideally I'd connect an LED to the button so that the LED illuminates when the button is pressed. However, I did the next best thing and picked a moment in time when I feel the button was pressed and counted frames. The result that I got was around 70 to 80 milliseconds of complete latency from button press to update on the screen. This value isn't great. It's coming close to the upper end of being able to detect it. I tested this across two games and the result was similar in both tests. Speaking about the controls, the most obvious question that gets asked is, is the controller comfortable? The answer is yes, with some caveats. The dominant controller style is relatively straightforward and feels like a normal extension of your body. Sliding into an FPS is straightforward, and if I had to find a fault, it would be with regard to the analog caps itself. I really would like it if the analog cap was concave like the Xbox series of controllers. The convex nature of the Win 3 analog stick, even with the texturing on the top, it can be slippery. 
I suppose the one saving grace about the design of the Win 3 with its always protruding analog sticks is that you can add new analog toppers to change the analog feel yourself without having to worry about a clamshell screen coming down on it. One thing that I was pleasantly surprised about was the L1 and R1 triggers. Obviously, the big deal is the L2 and R2 are analog triggers now, specifically for any game where you need to finesse that input, like in racing games, but even the feel and click of the L1 and R1 are incredibly satisfying. Its total impact feels like a sizable upgrade over the Win Max triggers, a big overall improvement. The part of the controls that are a bit of a letdown is using the D-pad and face buttons. As you all know, the Vita D-pad and face buttons are what I consider to be top shelf in terms of quality, and the GPD Win 3 mimics them with great accuracy. The problem really comes down to where they are positioned. What I found that I've had to do was reposition my hand and move the entire device up, making the triggers no longer accessible. To GPD's credit, the back paddle buttons do sit right where my fingers land, and if I had the controller firmware available to make use of it, I'd really like to know what that feels like. But at the moment, this review is going to go live before that's available. So stay tuned for when that update becomes available. I'll make a video about that separately. I've had a few people ask me if my fingers hit the screen when I'm using the buttons, and that's honestly the least of worries when using this device. I don't actually think about it. Pretty much the major issue with the comfort of the controls happens when you need to traverse vertically. It's never been a problem when hitting the screen. It's been a problem with subconsciously moving my thumb in a spot that I anticipate a D-pad or button to be when I'm using the analog sticks. And sometimes I'll hit the completely wrong button. Regarding the rumble motors, I'm happy the rumble is there. But I honestly feel like the rumble was added so that you have feedback for the keyboard not to add rumble to the gamepad. The quality of the actual rumble itself feels like a cell phone rumbling. It's actually quite nice when it's very faint. And for games that you let you tune the rumble intensity, I would very much recommend to make it the minimum it can possibly be. The intensity of the rumble motors themselves, when they go past a certain RPM, loses the distinction that rumble is supposed to offer. Nuance when playing games not just to chaotically vibrate. Suffice to say that if you can tune the rumble motors in games, you should. The last bit that I wanted to mention is the Win 3 is right justified in its weight distribution because of the giant battery located in that section. Overall, when using the device, I didn't notice this at all. All right, let's talk about that keyboard. It's not good. The, the, the most generous I could possibly be with regard to the Win 3 keyboard is that it's better than nothing. The capacitive touch has me pecking at it with my fingers to get the job done. My word per minute score remains around 19 words per minute with an extremely low accuracy thanks to the shift key failing to register. I sometimes think if the keyboard was just physical, it would have elevated this keyboard to usable. For reference, I have a 43 word per minute score on the GPD Win 2 with a very high accuracy. So in comparison to the Win 2, it's objectively half as good for me and yet manages to feel even worse than that. I didn't have high hopes for the keyboard on the Win 3, and I'm still disappointed. <laughs> Worthy mentionables that I don't know where to put in a topic. The GPD Win 3 will fit into most universal Switch-like cases with little modification, which is a bonus. I found this canvas case that I like for 10 bucks, and it fits well with the analog portions destined to go on the bottom. As a person on my Discord pointed out, there is a spot for additional microSD cards in these pouches. Unfortunately, I did order... Switch Lite tempered glass screen protectors, and they are just a wee bit too large to work. That's unfortunate. Now for the conclusion of my review. The 1165G7 version is really the version you should be getting. You'll see performance bumps all the way down to 5 watts and can take it higher than the 1135G7 version can even go. The pros of the Win 3 are that it's now the smallest, most powerful device to date. There is nothing within the foreseeable future that will match its power within its weight class. It is a featherweight fighting in the heavyweight bracket. Having something the size of the Switch Lite capable of going up to 35 watts is outrageously impressive. For people that said the Win Max was too large, this is now the most powerful device in a smaller form factor. The Win 2 remains smaller in overall dimensions, but lacks the power of the Win 3 by a considerable margin. The inclusion of analog triggers is also a very welcome addition. When looking at the design considerations of the Win 3, I do find it hard to think how else you could add as much as the Win 3 contains in the size that it is. The cons of the Win 3... First, we have to point out that we are waiting on Intel to fix their drivers for some of the latest modern AAA games to even work. I'm confident Intel will get this done, but in the meantime, we're waiting for this to happen. 
The bigger problems I have with Win 3 is that its gaming first design has sacrificed nearly every part of the UMPC design. It manages to be larger than the Win 2 and yet have a smaller screen. Its size, plus the fact that the analog sticks protrude out, means you can no longer actually put the device in your pocket. The slider screen is legitimately cool, but underneath hides a keyboard you only want to use when you absolutely need to. Anyone who buys the Win 3 will have the most powerful computer in their home that they won't want to use as a computer. The only meaningful way to use it as your computer would be to dock it. I know that a lot of people feel this design is the best for a PC gaming handheld, and it is a good gaming console. If you are a person who bought the Win Max and are happy with that form factor, I'd suggest to wait for the successor to the Win Max to come out. But for those people that wanted a gaming-centric handheld PC, this is the device for you. If you said the Max is too large, well, this is the smallest device this year. There won't be a smaller PC gaming handheld in this performance class. So this is for you. The GPD Win 3 isn't a UMPC. It's an incredibly powerful handheld gaming console. And if that's what you want, then this is for you. As always, guys, thank you for your time, and thanks for watching.